please welcome to the stage best-selling author and Forbes 21st Century AI Maverick and Visionary Award recipient, Sol Rashidi. I swear, it never gets easier. I always think I'm going to have a Sandra Bullock Miss Congeniality moment every time I walk through, for those of you guys who have seen the movie. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the time zone. I know folks have flown in from all over the world. Um, but I have to admit, regardless of how much sleep you got, you guys showed up last night. Broadway was full. Um, so congratulations for exploring the city to its fullest. My name is Sol Rashidi, and I'm going to talk to you about sometimes the fun, sometimes the ugly, sometimes the unexpected topic of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's an interesting time that we live in, isn't it? All right, to get going, here's a bit of an icebreaker. I'll give you guys a moment to read. What do AI and teenage conversations have in common? Everyone talks about it. Nobody knows how to do it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it, so then they claim they're doing it. Now, this is the PG version of it. You guys obviously know what I'm talking about, so use your imagination. But that's kind of what's happening right now. So the good news is, if you have FOMO, or if you're nervous that you're not doing enough, please don't. Rest assured, the world is still catching up. Now, by way of introduction, I actually had the opportunity of taking a look at some of you individuals, and you guys are all very successful in your own right. So if you'll allow me a few seconds, maybe even a minute, to just introduce myself and build some credibility of why me. Um, I'm a Persian-American woman. I'm an... Ah, thank you. I'm an older mother of two younger kids. I had my oldest at 38. You guys can do the math. Uh, we are a household of five. My mother has lived with me since my second was born, and because of the support of my mother and my husband, I get to do what I love, which is to bridge the gap between the technical world and the non-technical world. Now, this wasn't always a calling. This completely happened by accident. No one grows up and says, hey, I want to be a mathematics genius or a computer scientist or a data scientist. It was a president, astronaut, doctor. Especially in my culture, you're either a doctor or a lawyer or a professor. Like, there's no other options. Um, but I actually played professional sports. I played rugby on the U.S. women's national team coming out of college. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, times have changed, obviously. Um, but what happens when we age? We don't recover as quickly, do we? A good night out, like last night. A pickup game at the field. I mean, heck, even getting out of bed sometimes, I'm like, how do you sleep wrong? But sometimes a shoulder is going to hurt, sometimes a hip is going to hurt. And that's exactly what had happened. And so I said, OK, it's time that I not play sports and travel and sleep on futons and eat ramen noodles all day long, but I should probably get a real job. And the first job I got was a data engineer role. It was geeky, but I found my tribe. I loved our Dilbert cartoons and our Marvel comic statues, and I had found, I was a nerd at heart, and I didn't even know about it. Long story short, I was there for six months, and then they pulled me aside, and they said, Sol, we love you, but you're never allowed to touch a lick of code again. And I, and I was stuck, and I was like, oh my god, I'm getting fired. They're like, but you seem to like people, and we don't, so <laughs> your job is you're going to communicate everything that we do to the business, and then gather their requirements and what it is that they want built, and then come back to us and tell us what they want built. And I was like, all right. And at first, I thought I was just a gopher. But I fell in love with the business community. I learned P&L statements. I learned strategic initiatives. It just came naturally. I mean, I am Persian. We're merchants by trade, so it, it, business just naturally is in our DNA. But then I was able to take over everything that they wanted to the engineers. And then I could talk their language, too. Now, I wasn't able to write code, but I could understand code. I understood the processes and the methods behind everything. Long story short, I've built an entire career out of being a translator between the non-technical world and the technical world. 
And I had the wonderful fortune of working for IBM, and I was known as their internal data gal, data lead, data expert. And then something pivotal happened, right? Talk about the power of suddenly. Watson beat Jennings in Jeopardy in 2011. How many of you guys saw that? A few of us? Yes. It was a really pivotal moment because that's when IBM decided to take Watson to market. And I wanted in. And so I gracefully begged my boss's 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 boss, who knew of me for four months straight, because everyone wanted to be in Watson. It was like the cool thing to do. And I got my chance. And it was amazing. And I've been in the artificial intelligence space since 2011. I've also had some good fortune, and I've taken some risks. But since IBM Watson, I was a partner at IBM and at Ernst & Young. I was the first chief data and AI officer in 2016, before AI was even spoken about for Royal Caribbean, the cruise lines. Um, I was the executive vice president for Sony Music, uh, their chief data officer. I was the chief data and analytics officer for Merck Pharmaceuticals and the chief analytics officer for Estee Lauder. Lots of industries, but as to quote my father, same sand, different shovel. <laughs> Um, from there, I resigned exactly a year ago from Enterprise. I was burnt out, I was exhausted, and something, again, pivotal happened. In November of 2022, ChatGPT came out. Finally, the space that I had been working in for so long was no longer just available to other enterprises and other companies, but the product, the capability, was actually available for us consumers. You can Google right now free AI tool marketing, free AI tool sales, and you will get dozens and dozens and dozens of options. And that, to me, has just been groundbreaking. So I spent the past year traveling the world, doing the research, doing the work, writing a book, et cetera. And then I decided to go back in the belly of the beast because the pace of change is so fast. And as of 50 days ago, I became the head of technology in North America for Amazon for their startup division. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> All that's to say, I don't know everything, and I never will claim, but I know enough. All right, so timeline of artificial intelligence. There is no shortage of information coming at us. LinkedIn, social media, now everyone's an expert. And I'm like, you've been in the space for a year and a half. How on earth are you able to claim an expert? And it doesn't matter what newsletter or articles you're reading, it's everywhere three key pivotal movements that happened that brought us to this day and age. 1997, IBM, Deep Blue, televised a chess match against the world's greatest player. The machine won. 2011, IBM again televised Watson and Kent Jennings, the world's greatest Jeopardy player, and the machine won. And then in November 2022, all of a sudden our nieces, our children, our neighbors, they were using this thing called ChatGPT, and the world awoke to artificial intelligence. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but a fun fact. Do you guys know that before OpenAI released ChatGPT, they had spent $2 billion in eight years of research? For us, we just woke up to it, but it's been around for decades and decades and decades. But here's the funny thing about artificial intelligence. It, it's kind of like, it, it's hard to grasp. We know of the two letters. We know one stands for artificial. We know another stands for intelligence. But here's a cheat sheet. How on earth do you even define AI? OK, machines doing stuff. But this was a fun back of the napkin drawing that I think is absolutely brilliant that was created in 2018. And it comes ultimately down to our senses. Can it see? Can it reason? Can it hear or can it read? And so we're going to go through just two exercises, just to sharpen up our skills. So next time someone's trying to sell you something that's called AI, you're not falling for it. You can actually distinguish whether you should pay that premium or not. Or, you know, it's a good coffee conversation just to kind of sharpen up your skills. All right, so the easy one. Can it see? If it can't see, forget it. We're not even starting the conversation. But if it can see, can it identify? what it sees. If it cannot, sorry folks, it's a camera. That's easy. However, if it can identify what it sees, you're now starting to get into 
realms of computer vision and machine learning. Can it tell the difference between a cat and a giraffe? Can it tell the difference between a dog and a lion? That's what we're referring to as computer vision and machine learning. It is understanding the difference between objects, and it can tell you what those differences are. All right? Can it reason? You give it a massive Excel spreadsheet or your CRM system, whatever it may be, just a data set. Can it find patterns within that data set? If it cannot, apologies, not AI, not even close to it. But if it can find patterns within that data set, wait a second, can it help you make business decisions? If the answer is no, it's math. But if it can recognize patterns and it can help you make business decisions, you're starting to get into the realms of machine learning. Because it's learning your industry, it's learning your data set, it's learning your way of operating, it can actually start making suggestions. So this is a fun little cheat sheet. If you guys want to take a picture, I will stand to the side. Oh yeah, cameras are coming out, come on. And then you can zoom in on it later. Just follow this basic decision tree. It's a great and fun way um, just to have a conversation around artificial intelligence. Oh, you guys want me to go back? Oh, okay, so here you go. <laughs> I feel like I need to duck and get out of the way. Hold on. I'll do the Vanna White. Okay. Now, the state of AI today, how on earth does, do you tell the difference between fact versus fiction? All right. So I have a pet peeve, and the pet peeve is the word artificial. There is nothing artificial about artificial intelligence, but it's a great marketing term. Because the fact of the matter is, is we're teaching everything it knows. It is still fingers to keyboards, and it's us humans training it. Very similar, if you have nieces and nephews or children, they go to first grade, they learn mathematics. They're learning mathematics in school. They get homework. They have to do the homework. Sometimes they get it wrong, sometimes they get it right. But we tell, it if, we tell our children if they got it wrong or right. Then they go back and take tests to see what they got wrong versus what they, what they got right. Over time, they know what's wrong, and they eventually develop an understanding for what's right. That is the same process with machine learning. The machine is learning. We are training it. We are teaching it. But what's interesting is it can understand objects a lot easier than context. I'll give you an example. It can easily understand the difference between a cat and a giraffe because it can memorize the pixelations. But where it's starting to get beautiful is if I say the word gray, gray is in mood or gray is in color? If I use the term cold feet because I'm standing in the snow or because I'm about to get married, of which I had the latter, by the way, um, that contextual understanding is where the sophistication is going. So is it perfect? Absolutely not. But are we? Absolutely not. But it does really, really well with information that's very clear cut, black and white, and then we have our gray zones, and that's where it's starting to become more sophisticated. But going back to the pet peeve of artificial, it's not artificial because we are training it. But anywhere in the world you go, in any of the applications right now that are being used, falls under three categories. Automated intelligence, augmented intelligence, and anticipatory intelligence. Still AI, but none of it's artificial. So what do we mean by, let's say, augmented intelligence? I'll give you an example. Take a massive, massive company, P&G, Unilever, Estee Lauder, L'Oreal, Coleman, REI, just any consumer products or retail company. When you call into the customer service center, oftentimes it's about a complaint, but what if you have a question about a product? And they have 80,000 products. Can you expect a customer service rep to memorize? that manual of 80,000 products? No. But also, those 80,000 products are constantly changing. Things are being retired. There's no longer inventory. New products are being launched. It is nearly impossible to have those expectations upon a customer service rep. And not to mention, it takes nine months to get a customer service rep in production. Why? Because the first three months, they're just learning the products. 
Then the next three months, they're shadowing to make sure that they understand how to feel the calls. And then the last three months, they're applying what they know. But those expectations are massive. However, where in this case, automated and aug augmented comes into play is what if you were able to take all that information, everything in the PDF, and have a little virtual agent next to you. So if someone asks, of all your products, which ones are vegan, you don't have to memorize that. You can just write which one of our products are vegan, and it'll give you a list of products. And within seconds, you can actually respond to that phone call. Or, I just bought this. It says it was recalled. Has it been recalled in our state yet? Can you expect someone to memorize that? So warranties, recalls, product information, it's a perfect, perfect example of augmented intelligence. And you're automating the entire process as well. Now, what's anticipatory? Anticipatory intelligence is all around predictions. You guys do this to a certain degree right now. You understand trends around neighborhood analytics, property value evaluations. But what you know is based on how something has trended and your knowledge base. But what if there are macroeconomic components? What if there are currency aspects that are going to create these trends to go up or down outside of the margin of error that we're used to? That's what anticipatory intelligence is. So if you see applications of AI, it's not artificial. It's either augmented, <laughs> automated, or anticipatory. So that's a little fun fact for you as well. Now, this is where it gets fun. It is impacting all industries. And there's a, there's a wonderful little box around real estate, because yes, it's also impacting your industry as well. So the consensus is it's impacting all industries. People are either kicking the tires to understand how does it impact them, uh, or they're looking at, at an enterprise level, how do we make things easier? Or they're looking at ways to improve efficiency or productivity. So the discussions are being had at an industry level, but if you take a look across functions, there is a function that is being impacted the most. Sales and marketing. With all due respect, the greatest salesperson or agent, are they the best at data entry? <laughs> no, because their job is to have a conversation, is to build relationships, is to understand the needs and wants of their clientele. The last thing they want to be doing is entering information into a spreadsheet. And towards the end, I'll actually share some fun use cases for you of how it's actually going to be able to help your day-to-day -day as well. And same with marketing. Marketing is a very time-consuming and laborious process from images, copies, translations. And so functions that fundamentally take a lot of time are the first to be transformed because there's just so much opportunity to get rid of the administrative tasks, the stuff that's boring, so that we can focus on the core things that we love to do.